He had some flowers start to pop up at my house uh, early, and we just we had a little mini funeral for them today because they don't know they're going to die in a few days. But uh, it's good to be with you. Hey, my name is Stephen, one of the pastors. If you're a Bible, and I hope that you do, turn to Ruth uh, chapter 1. We're going to wrap up chapter 1 today as we journey through this series. We've kind of put this tag on this series from ruin to redemption as what we see God do in the life of Ruth. God ultimately does in Christ for every single one of us, takes us from uh, a spiritual famine, needing him for everything, all the way to uh, redemption together. Ruth chapter 1, we'll pick up in verse 19 in just a minute there. Uh, as you're turning there, I, I went to a, a small public high school in, in Texas. We had uh, 26 people in my graduating class, which is like a little bit bigger than homeschool and a little bit smaller than most Christian private schools. So we were just kind of nestled right there in the middle. And so not much happened. Uh, we started going there when I was in fourth grade. Pre-K through 12th grade was all on the same campus, and a lot of it was in the same building. So like very small area, not a lot happened. When somebody new came to town, it was a big, big, big deal, Right. And so I got there in fourth grade, and I still kind of felt like the new kid when we graduated eight years later together. But I remember my sophomore year, we were about to start uh, the football season, which like in Texas is everything you think it is. It's absolutely crazy, this idolatrous thing that will not be that way in heaven. The the Seahawks will win in heaven, and Texas football will be not as quite as big of a humongous deal as it is. But we had this kid coming. His name was Joe, and he was from uh, Odessa Permian, the Friday Night Light School. Uh, and so, okay, this guy's got to be really good, right? Like, the show wasn't out yet. I think the movie uh, had been shot but not released yet, but the book was out. So people kind of, and people knew about this big mega football powerhouse school in West Texas. And so this kid, Joe, was coming. He played for them. He was going to play for us. We were pumped. Like, we had just gone to the state quarterfinals, but this Joe kid's going to push us over the top. I bet he's huge. I, there's nothing to do in West Texas but hit each other and play football. And so I bet he's big and tall and strong and fast, and this is going to be great. Uh, Joe showed up, and he was tall, but that was it. He was skinny, like, like uh, concerningly skinny, um, and he was really slow and just soft, like you'd bump him and he'd go flying off the, the field, you know, and he wasn't real smart, which is being generous uh, to Joe. And so all that to say, like, we were so pumped for him to get into town. And once he got there, his arrival was extremely underwhelming, very disappointing. He got hurt like the third day of two a days and never made any meaningful kind of impact on the field. Uh, today in our story, you're going to see Naomi and Ruth uh, return. They're going to come back to the small town of Bethlehem, the same town that produces us uh, baby Jesus at Christmas time, right? And Naomi's been gone for 10 years in Moab. She comes back with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, and the town begins to stir. Uh, and her arrival is not at all what people expected. It's probably disappointing to Naomi, to Ruth, and all the people living in Bethlehem. Nobody's really happy with this kind of so far. And yet God is working in all of these little details. So Ruth chapter 1 we're going to read verse 19 through 22, share a prayer, then begin our time in God's word this morning. So the two of them, that's Naomi and Ruth, went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred up because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Let's pray together. Father, thanks for the gift of your word to each one of us together today. God, thank you for uh, just the story of Ruth, for uh, the themes that we talked about last week, for seeing this covenant kindness and how you redeem us from our own personal ruin and take us all the way to uh, redemption. God, I'm ultimately grateful that more than a book about Ruth or Naomi or Boaz, this is a story about Jesus, about how you continue to move Uh, in your kind providence, behind the details, behind the scenes of our life. God, moving us and the world that you created, that we screwed up, that you redeemed, you are moving that world to a good and right purpose. And so God, we gather together today in part to remember to place our trust on you. 
to, to live out the things that we just sang about, that even when we can't see you or even when it doesn't feel like it, that we believe that you're working. And so, God, guide our time together today. Would you be honored each and every time we open up your word? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Because this is such a short book, I want to just bring a few things to our reminder every time we open it over the next few weeks. Uh, we talked about kind of three reasons to study the book of Ruth last week. I want to jog your memory of those things. Uh, Ruth is not just a women's ministry book. It's not a fairy tale, like Aesop type fable from which we glean some life principles. The book of Ruth is God's word, just as much as the gospel of Mark, as Revelation, as Genesis. Uh, Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, that each one of us would be equipped, uh, complete and equipped for every good work. Not just spiritual works, uh, not just church work, but every single thing you and I need, the best authority place to go to for help, and that is God's word. That's why we need Ruth. Uh, Ruth displays God's persistent providence. This uh, never-ending desire and action on God's part on behalf of you and me. That even when life gets tricky and difficult, and maybe especially when it is those ways, that God is actively working uh, behind the scenes much more so than we realize. Every time you and I see God's hand do something, there's a thousand things that go unseen. And then lastly, we see that the, the, the tent of what it means to follow God, what it means to belong to uh, the nation of Israel and now the church is, is ever widening. That we see God's heart for the nations and maybe even specifically God's heart for the people that you and I are prone to hate or dislike or be annoyed by or think that tolerating is good enough, but that we're called to love, to love uh, God's people especially And so the fact that God takes Naomi, this Moabite, Ruth, this Moabite, uh, traditional enemy of God's people, Israel, and not only grafts her into the kingdom, but uses her in the lineage of David to bring us baby Jesus uh, generations later is huge, and it shouldn't be lost on us. We're going to see these same two themes consistently throughout Ruth, this idea of, of covenant kindness. An unworldly kind of kindness that does not come from you and me trying to grit our teeth and be nice in sort of a character trait kind of way, but in a way that says, because God has been rich in mercy towards us, I can now extend that to other people. You see God doing that in the book of Ruth. We see Naomi, Boaz, Ruth, all at different points, uh, giving each other this level of kindness that has lifelong ramifications, consequences for how they live the rest of their life. And then we're going to see redemption. We'll see this more next week, but this idea that there needs to be a a purchasing back of us from something else that we uh, once wanted. Do you ever feel like we're guilty of wanting kind of the next shiny new thing? Right? Like like, uh, it's the reason iPhones have come out with like 17 versions of a phone and why some people will pay uh, like $1,200 for a new phone that's going to break a year later. Uh, I don't know, I shove mine in my, by my back pocket. Every, every three times I get out of my car, it comes catapulting onto the parking lot. Like, like uh, I've bought in cars for not much more than what I've paid for an iPhone before. Uh, but we just go through stuff a lot, don't we? And we want the next thing, the new thing, the shiny thing. Well, when Naomi comes into Bethlehem, Naomi does not come back to town as the nice, new, shiny thing. She intended to go on this brief sojourn over to Moab to get some groceries And it ended up into this decade-long detour, really, from what God may have wanted for her and her family. She comes back into town as the old thing, uh, as the the passed over thing. And I don't know about you, I would imagine that as you've aged through life, there are some decades that just hit us harder than others. Have you seen those those, uh, photos of presidents as they, when they enter off, as then when they leave? If they're there for four years, it looks like they've been there for ten if they serve two terms, it looks like they put it like 20 years into the job, right? Th- those Moab famine recovery years must have hit Naomi, I think, pretty hard because she comes into town and the, the town begins to stir. Look at verse 19. The two of them went on till they came to Bethlehem. And when they got to town, the whole town was stirred up because of them. That, that word stirred there it has this idea of this, 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 a considerable amount of disorder, uh, some almost chaos there. They say, is this, is this Naomi? Now, now, maybe you grew up in a smaller town and you know this kind of life, where everybody knows everybody's business, for better or worse, churches can be like that sometimes if we're not careful. And all it takes is like one person coming back in the back door after a while back and everyone begins to talk and chatter and gossip and wonder. And listen, as, as much as Naomi might have been looking forward to coming uh, back home, she returns in a very different state than when she left, right? You might remember when she left, she left with a husband, uh, Elimelech. She left with, with two sons. 
Uh, and, and they're fleeing from what they perceive as an untenable situation. They've got to go get some, some food. And we're not sure if that was the right move or not. Uh, but I can tell you what was the wrong move was her sons marrying Moabite women. In that time, from what God had told his people, that was sort of out of bounds for them. And so you see a, a bit of faithlessness on the part of Naomi's family. But they're struggling to do the best they can. And like you and like me still, they have moments of faithfulness and moments of, of fickleness. Uh, and then Ruth there. Ruth is a Moabite. She never know, it's not going back home for her. She's never been to Bethlehem before. Uh, Ruth doesn't have like Alaska Airlines frequent flyer miles to use. She's probably never been further than a walking distance away from her house. Um, she was likely born and, and raised and grew up and married all within a few block radius of where she grew up in Moab. So everything is new to her. She's probably thinking this is the start of a, of a new relationship with her mother-in-law. She's got to have all kinds of fear stepping into this next level of what God has for her. Uh, and, and she's a brand new follower of God. Do you remember when you first started following Jesus? There's kind of this, uh, it's frustrating when you're the, the new Christian in some ways because you want to know that what you don't know. But there's this beauty in the zeal of a new believer, isn't there? Especially adults. When adults come to know Christ and you're like, oh my gosh, this is a completely new system of thinking and prioritizing and who we now belong to, where we search for identity and acceptance. And it's just encouraging to especially those of us that have become little fuddy-duddies in our faith. We've been following Jesus and doing this routine thing for so long. Seeing someone be so excited reminds us of when we were that excited, right? But they don't know what they don't know. Like, you can follow Jesus and not understand the virgin birth, but then when you sit down and try to and do this this week, Go try to explain to someone who doesn't either know Jesus or just started following Jesus how the virgin birth is true and right and makes sense. You're like, okay, so there's this girl Mary, and there's this guy Joseph, and then there's God. And there may have been a, a more handsome, more muscular carpenter on the street, but Mary promises it's not his baby, it's really God's baby, it's not Joseph's baby, but they're pure, another talk of the town. And you see this in Jesus' ministry. As he goes uh, and grows up 30 years later, there's still this scandalous rumor of how he came uh, to be. It doesn't make sense on, on paper. That's where Ruth is spiritually. She is brand new, but notice the level of trust she's placed in a God she doesn't know. Most of us, you and me in here, are educated past our love of obedience. You and I probably don't need another Bible study. You don't need another uh, degree, another book. We probably know too much, and we obey too little. The reality is we know plenty uh, to obey more, to walk in deeper dependence than uh, we are. Naomi left uh, with a good life and seems to have returned with a difficult life. And then you see in her prayer here in verse 20, which we'll read in just a minute, um, one of the most compelling reasons, I think, for trusting the Bible, for believing that it tells us the truth, not just about um, who God is, but its own historicity, its accuracy, its trustworthiness, is the amount of, we'll just call this embarrassing testimony about itself. We saw this a lot in Mark's gospel, didn't we? Now, if you're Mark and you're discipled by Peter, nowhere does Peter look more like a fool than in the gospel of Mark. If you're making up a fake story, don't you edit some of that stuff out, right? Like especially this three denial part as Jesus is getting arrested and is going to get ready to die on the cross for your sins. And no disciple has been more prominently featured than Peter as Peter is teaching Mark the story of Jesus and telling him how and what to write down. Don't you think he would redact that part to make himself look a little bit better? Think of what you'd like to have in your obituary now. There's probably some things you'd like to highlight and emphasize and some things that you were just as happy to not highlight and emphasize, right? Like if we were making this stuff up, we would edit this stuff out. Similarly, look at the way Naomi talks about God. I wonder if this is a part that would go, if she were making this up, this looks like a bit of faithlessness on her part. She rolls back in and people say, hey, it's Naomi. And she says, verse 20, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Now imagine you're Ruth and you're hearing that. Naomi just basically shared the gospel with her as much as she knew. And Ruth's like, hey, I'm all in with God. And then they, they're journeying from Moab to, back to Bethlehem and Judah, which isn't like a, a quick trot. Maybe there's some teaching going on about who God is. Maybe Ruth learned about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We don't know those things yet. But then the very first words out of Naomi's mouth on her homecoming tour is, God's dealt bitterly with me, change my name. And Ruth is like, what's that now? <laughs> I thought this was this God who was quick in mercy, slow to become angry, abounding in steadfast love for our people, but apparently there's a limit to that. Now imagine for a second if we came up today, and, and I tried this with you, 
I said, hey, welcome to Faith Church. My name is Bitter. I'm one of the pastors here. <laughs> if you have your Bible, I hope that you do. Turn to Ruth chapter If I said, ah, oh, yeah, some of you may know me as Stephen. That's my old name. Sometime, somehow, between last week and this week, God has dealt exceedingly bitterly to me. So now I'd like to, you to call me uh, Mara Bitter. Maybe it's Maro if you're a boy. I don't know. It's been a while since I took Hebrew, right? Uh, but you say, hey, call me, call me bitter now because God's just dealt bitterly with me. But I'd like to tell you how good he is, though, if, if you have some time. It doesn't make sense, right? Naomi looks a bit like a fool in this passage, if we're honest. Look at verse 21. I went away full, she says, and the Lord, and that's in all caps in your letter, that's Yahweh, this relational name for God, this covenantal name for God. Uh, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me? And the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. Notice here, we'll kind of unpack this in a little bit, but do you catch this, the honesty, the, the rawness of Naomi's speech there? We don't know if she turns this into a sort of a lamenting prayer before God, but I bet she does. We see plenty of other people do in the scriptures. But we need to rediscover the honesty and trust found in lament. We need to rediscover the honesty and trust found in lament. Naomi is clearly in this process, right, a spiritual process of coming to grips with her current circumstance in light of God's goodness. And you and I have been there, haven't we? Something happens to you or the result of your bad decision making or someone else's, the combination thereof, or just the reality that we are not yet in heaven, so life is not perfect on this side of that plan. Uh, And so we get into a circumstance that's difficult that's confusing, that's frustrating, and we're trying to grasp and wrestle with that. How is God good if this is happening or if this didn't happen? What is God up to? Does God exist? If he does, does he care for me? We would probably rightly understand, especially based on the physical uh, circumstance of Naomi's fleeing and displacing herself as a refugee, living in a country that's traditionally been her enemy. It'd be like if you and I ran out of food, had to go to Afghanistan and go to the grocery store, and and we're there and we're trying to find our way and, and, and build a life. It's that kind of stark of a contrast, I think. It'd be very unsettling. Different language, different values, different uh, people groups, different skin colors. Looked at in different ways just because of our exterior uh, appearances and maybe even because of the things we do value and cherish and and treasure. And so Naomi was in trauma and probably still is. And she's trying to grasp and, and understand all of these things after maybe the homecoming she thought would go better has already got off to a choppy start. It, there's honesty in her lament because she's not ignoring the difficult part of our lives. You should beware of uh, Christian friends or Bible teachers or pastors or churches or denominations that uh, propagate some type of like toxic positivity in a spiritual sense, right? Uh, as a Jesus follower, like Job t- teaches this, the rain falls on the righteous and unrighteous alike. You're, it's okay to have bad days, right? It's okay to be honest about that which is not right in your life. Jesus teaches us to pray that God's kingdom in heaven would be done on earth, right? Meaning there is this gap there. There is a chasm in the way God always intended life to be and the way at least that we're experiencing it right now. And it is okay to pray to God to drag that kingdom from heaven down on earth uh, a little bit more today. And we see the brokenness of that all around in your life and in mine, in our society. And so the next time something difficult is happening in your life, um, the spiritual answer is not to pretend like it doesn't exist. Just like it's not to over-exaggerate it and make it worse than it is. The Bible gives us this lament category of Psalms and language, Ecclesiastes, so much of Proverbs, a ton of the Psalms, gives us this language uh, for levying our complaints to God. Because nothing you're going to say to God or even about him is going to wobble Jesus off his throne. And they can go, gosh, I wish they wouldn't have said that. We need a better PR team there at Faith Church. There's an honesty in the gift of lament. And and when it's offered as a true prayer uh, to God, which we'll see Naomi do that later in the book, when when that happens, there's a level of trust. And so you take this thing that's not going well in your life, that addiction, that that sin struggle, this piece of, of infertility, uh, the, the, the strained relationship that seems like it's never going to be repaired, that person that you love dearly that doesn't yet follow Jesus and seems to be getting further and further and further away from doing so as life goes on, whatever that thing is for you. When you and I take that in a lament and lay it at God's feet, it's like we're surrendering control over that thing. We're saying, God, I don't like this. This isn't fair. But I know that I'm not in charge of it, that he gets to do what he wants to with it. And in any kind of spiritual growth scenario, there's always three kind of jobs, right? 
you got to do your job, the other person has to do their job, and God's got to do his job. God's really good at doing his job. God is always, always perfectly doing his job. And, and so I hope that uh, the next time your life begins to go sideways, you can seize on to this gift that lament is, to be honest and to trust and uh, to yield. Verse 21, she picks this interesting name, Mara. There's an a interesting history of, of this word among God's people. When the Israelites back in Exodus chapter 15 uh, rebelled against God in the wilderness, they were uh, constantly and pretty quickly complaining about his lack of provision for them. They had literally just been set free from Egypt, from slavery. The Red Sea thing happened three days ago. And sometimes I think like maybe through a cartoon or like a, a felt board a Sunday school story, we forget like the magnitude of this deliverance. Uh, in Numbers 26, we learned that there were about 600,000 fighting men in that group that God set free from Egyptian slavery. So you factor in women and children. I don't know what you have to be to be a non-fighting man, but I bet there were some of those too. Uh, we're talking upwards well above 2 million people being set free without ever picking up a spear any one of them. And they weren't set free from like a, a, a few squadrons of chariots and horsemen. Egypt was the, the global military power of the day. And Pharaoh quickly dispatched like his black ops special forces, like the chariots and the horsemen. And without lifting a finger, uh, God swallows them up with the sea and, and delivers two plus million of his own people safely. And now they're wandering in the wilderness for three days. They can't find water. God sets his people free. Moses has this incredible worship song in Exodus 15, and then we get to Exodus 15, verse 22. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness to be sure. It's their first little hiking camping trip as free people, right? They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, two plus million people, no water. That's a problem. We don't want to ignore that piece of suffering, but that's a thing. Verse 23. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a log, and Moses threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? The place was already called Mara. The water was bitter. They couldn't drink it because the place was called Mara. But that's why the place was called Mara. <laughs> God is inviting his people into dependence, not independence. God, in, in, still today, is inviting you and me, just like he was Naomi and Ruth, just like he was the people of Israel who had just gotten set free, to be reminded that even though God did this great work in your life in the past, he's still not done. That just because God saved you and forgave your sins three days later, a week later, a decade or two later, you and I still desperately need Jesus for every good thing in our life. We don't just need him for salvation then, we need him for every good thing today. There is a reason you didn't die in your sleep last night. And it's not because you consciously remembered, I need to breathe every two and a half seconds. But you did, because God cares about you, and he loves you, and he's not done with you. He's inviting you and me into dependence on him. And, and so God's going to provide water for them. This was never a, a trap. Uh, God isn't tricking his people, uh, but he wants Moses to do the thing that he asked him to do, which sounds really weird. Hey, chuck this log in there. How come you didn't think of that first? <laughs> It's not go to this fancy alkaline water station or go to Costco and buy the pH water or whatever. It's like, hey, get that ratty old tree stump full of ants and chuck it in the water. And God wants his people to continue to depend on him, to stop trying to figure everything out on their own, out of their own strength, out of their own power. Similarly with Naomi and similarly with you and me. God is going to provide for you and for me, but he wants us to walk in dependence on him. But now what if, uh, what if Naomi's right? Remember what she said about God? He's dealt bitterly with me. I went away uh, full. I came back empty. Um, sounds like God's out to get Naomi, doesn't it? What if she's right? I wonder today, do you have a faith big enough that allows God to do things you don't understand? That don't seem fair or right or good or loving? Because if we're not careful, I think we'll set up our concept of fairness. And we'll worship God as long as he adheres to that which we understand is fair. Or we'll have this idea of love, and it won't actually be defined by God, but it'll become the filter by which we interpret God's activity. It's kind of this chicken or the egg thing. Does God come first, and now we get to understand what love is in relation to him? Or do we, maybe without even thinking, set our idea of what fairness or love or goodness should be? And as long as God adheres to that idea, we'll worship and follow him and love him as good and right and fair. But do you have room in your life with Christ to trust and believe if God is doing something that doesn't make sense? Like, what if God is 
dealing bitterly with Naomi. God is at maximum causing and at minimum allowing all that happens to happen. I mean, God is at maximum causing. So like the Holocaust, 9-11. God is at, the most thing God could do is actively causing those things to happen. But at minimum, he's allowing them to happen. Meaning we have a God who we believe is strong enough to have done something to stop that and for whatever reason chose not to. The only reason you and I can get out of this truth is if we believe, like there's a belief called open theism that believes in part that God has so lovingly entered into time and space with us that he does not actually know what the future holds. So Hitler's rise to power would have been news to God Almighty. It sounds silly, right? Uh, that it, but that he has so limited himself that he can't actually see what's coming next. And, he, and because he set aside those powers to, to be with us, that we serve a God who is definitely empathetic with us now, but can't actually do anything about the things that he's displaying empathy over. Now that sounds silly, right? This sentence makes me uncomfortable. I don't know if it causes a little bit of a stir in you. The idea that God either can't know or can't do anything about the evil in our world makes me more uncomfortable. And so I don't know the divine dance always between uh, God's sovereignty, how it plays out in providence and human free will. And you see that dance here in Ruth, maybe more than most other books uh, in the scriptures. But God's either causing famines and spouses to die, or he's allowing that to happen because we live in a broken world, all the while being perfectly powerful enough and strong enough to intervene, yet for some reason chooses not to. Now, I don't think Naomi is right here. Uh, and we'll see that later on. I, I think she's wrong. In part, God never intervenes and says, yep, you're right. Now, now, Job complains in a very similar way. He actually uses some of the same language. He uses that word Mara. God's dealt bitterly with me, and God vindicates that part of Job. He says Job hasn't done or said anything sort of wrong here. And we know this. Naomi claims to have went away full, but do you remember what made her leave? A famine. <laughs> she didn't go away full. She went away, at least physically, grocery-wise, empty. And then he says she came back empty, and she did. She lost a husband, and she lost two sons. But she also lost the other daughter-in-law, Orpah, who took her up on her multiple given offer to go back to where she was from, and Ruth didn't. Ruth's presence with Naomi is an example of covenant kindness that proves Naomi's own lament wrong in this point. And lament doesn't have to be theologically accurate all the time. You ever call a friend, and you say, I, just, I need to vent. Can I just... Can I just unload for a few minutes, right? And that's actually a gift to listen. And I, it took me about nine years of being a husband to learn this. When that happens, we're not supposed to fix stuff. Do you know this? <laughs> no way told me this. We're just supposed to listen and go, that stinks. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> that's the shortest and most popular marriage best-selling book ever. Like the four men version is just, that stinks. Here's a pedicure. Or whatever the thing is for you, right? Like, <laughs> lament isn't about needing God to fix stuff even or being right all the time. It's about believing that we can trust the recipient of that lament, of that complaint, uh, to, to not give up on us in the process. And so I think you said, I think Naomi is wrong. I don't think God has dealt bitterly with her, and we'll see that as we play out over the next few weeks. But I love that she trusts God enough to accuse him of that. Uh, to be honest enough and to, to refuse to put on this veneer of church kind of niceties and to be real with her pain and with her suffering. And so in seasons of suffering for you and for me, I believe God's calling us to look up more than down. I think Naomi loses focus a bit on her reality. Uh, she over-romanticizes the past, right? And we do this in seasons of suffering, don't we? Ah, oh, just, like just like the recently freed Israelites. Wasn't it so much better in Egyptian slavery when we were having to make bricks and we were getting beat to death? That was wonderful, wasn't it? It's worse being free. This Moses guy keeps preaching at us. It's so annoying. Let's go back to slavery. We over-romanticize the past, just like Naomi does. I, God sent me away full when people were starving to death at that time. We over-romanticize the past and we overestimate the level of suffering we're in now because we get too focused on our situation and we lose focus on God. And so how do we do this? This sounds neat and whatever, but in seasons of suffering, how do you look up more than down? I use our church's core values to do this. First, Christ-centered. How much time are you spending in the Word and in prayer? Things like Sabbath, the things that you know you find God consistently in. Because what I found is that when suffering sets in in my life in the past, I tend to focus on that thing more than God. And I like to be a fixer, 
So if it's a financial thing, if it's a relationship thing, okay, I'm just going to give 110% effort into this thing, and then we'll get back to quiet times later because we're too busy right now. Uh, Martin Luther, the famous Protestant reformer, uh, once prayed for three hours every morning. It was a part of his spiritual routine. And someone asked him one time, one of his students, he said, how do you have time for this? And he goes, oh, I'm way too busy to not pray. He said, I've got way too much stuff to do. I can't do that on my own power, out of my own strength. I, I, have, I couldn't fathom not starting three hours in prayer. Now, spoil, I don't pray for three hours in the morning, but I'd like to pray some. It feels weird getting out of bed without having a bit of a moment of pause uh, to, to think about the day, about meetings, about responsibilities, and to yield those things over to God. And so are, are, in a season of suffering, are you living that Christ-centered life? Second, are you, are you living an hour-focused life? Few things will help give you better perspective in seasons of suffering than serving someone else. And it has little to do with looking at how much they have in relation to what you have, but this idea of life is just not all about you and about me. We can get this, uh, this angst about going to see like professional counselors, for example. And uh, I asked a friend, I think I told you this before, but I asked a friend one time who's a counselor, a godly Christian, biblical counselor, I said, hey, like, what's one thing you'd love to tell somebody who's in the fence about counseling? And he said that they're not special, that their circumstance, which feels sometimes like life or your marriage or your business or whatever is about to fall apart, that they're like a, a two o'clock on a Tuesday to us, that they see the same iterations of the same four or five things over and over and over again, which is a little bit humiliating, <laughs> but it's also encouraging, isn't it? Because not only do they know the path forward, but the pickle that you and I have gotten ourselves into is not actually all that unique to us. God's people just keep finding the same cycles of sin to get ourselves entangled in over and over and over again. And so serving someone else is a great way to put that into perspective. And then lastly, this family of faith idea. Do you have people with you? Far too often we're ashamed to share about the things in our life that are difficult or hard or trying. And so who's with you? Maybe a better question is who have you invited in with you? Because don't buy into the temptation that you've got to go get stuff figured out and perfect and buttoned up. And then once everything is kind of dealt with, then you can start finding friendships. And then you can get in a small group. And then you can find godly community. Nothing will accelerate community more than, and you've known this to be true, right? You've been in that small group setting or that class setting where one person kind of takes that risk, right? And they, they open up and they're a little bit more vulnerable. And you're like, I don't know how that's going to go. And it's like this waterfall of trust that happens where one after another after another begins to, to open up as well. But somebody's got to go first, and everybody is ready for that. And look at the end of verse 22 here, last thing. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of what? The barley harvest. Isn't there some decade-long famine going on? The reason they came back was all the way back in verse 6, they heard that God had kept his word and provided for his people. And so they get back to Bethlehem just in time when the grocery store is about to reopen. Toaster strudels are back in people's kitchens. Thanksgiving meals are going to happen again. Like God has provided and provided abundantly. And barley might not sound that great to you that way, but go 10 years without food and struggling to scrap things together. Barley sounds great. Usually, historically, every time harvest happens, there's this big communal party. This gratitude still about God's providence and his trust for his people. Uh, and you and I are experiencing that still today. The news of God providing for someone else got to Naomi and Ruth and it changed their life too. And this is still how God works. Through his persistent providence, God changes lives to change lives. He, he provided food for Naomi so that she could bring Ruth back to Bethlehem to be a part of Israel. To then be a part of God's family, to be a part of the, the Davidic line of Jesus. God changes lives to change lives. You could also finish that sentence in a number of different ways. Through persistent providence, God changes marriages to change marriages. You ever notice how when you start being honest about the way God has, has healed your life, which means you've got to tell people about the way you were jacked up before, God uses that same thing to help other people in that same spot. Have you noticed that before? It takes people being brave enough, right? Through God's persistent providence, God allows infertility to love others in infertility. Through persistent providence, God frees from addiction to free other people from addiction. God changes lives to change lives. And so I wonder today, has God changed your life? And is that a story then worth telling to, to someone else? Uh, God feeds Naomi and Ruth uh, not just to feed them because he loves them and he cares for them. He feeds them so that Ruth can meet Boaz next week. 
And so that they can have uh, Obed, so that Obed can have Jesse, so that Jesse can have David, so that 16 some odd generations later, Jesus can come up and save all of us from our sin. That's the reason God gave barley back then. God changed lives then because he knew that in Kent here today, people would need their lives changed by the goodness of God. By the reality that God is not absent in your season of suffering, he is up to way, way, way more than you and I can see. And the very first miraculous provision is not parting the Red Sea. It's not providing through a famine. It's the forgiveness of sins. This idea that you and I are not our mistakes. That's the way culture says. Culture looks at our urges and our desires and says, you've got to celebrate that. You've got to own that. You've got to become that thing now. Whatever you want to do, you're actually now a slave to that thing. Christianity is the freeing message. You are more than those things. You, the way God looks at you and me is the exact same way he looks at his son Jesus. Seated at the right hand of the Father, perfect, blameless. So level your laments to him. In doing so, that's trusting him. If you need to begin a relationship with Jesus today, as we close in worship now, there'll be prayer team partners on the side too that would love to talk to you about that. If there's things that in your life aren't going well, like maybe Naomi needed a prayer team as she comes back into Bethlehem. Some people to pray for her, to, to love her well, to hear her burdens, and to remind her to look up, not just down. Uh, those folks can do that as well today. But I want you to also consider, if God's changed your life, it's because he wants to change somebody else's life too. The gospel didn't stop right before it got to you and to me, praise God. And it's not going to terminate with you and me either. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for uh, the story of some of our spiritual fathers and mothers here in the book of Ruth. God, this great, fantastic short story that holds so much more for us than life principles, that holds the very gospel itself, the the pre-running efforts of you to bring Jesus, the true and better David, the one who will save us from our sins, forgive us of all the mistakes, both known and unknown to us, past, present, and future. Give us identity and acceptance and a purpose that's only found in you. And God, that you've changed each one of our lives in part because you desire to use us like you did Ruth, like you did Boaz and Obed and Jesse and David to change other people's lives too. So God, in the next season of suffering that awaits each one of us, would you deepen our dependence on you? Free us from the idol of independence. Fix our eyes up on you, not primarily down on us. Show us how to walk in the honesty and trust that only comes with lament. And to trust God in your persistent providence. And when we can't see your hand, we can trace your heart and know that you're good and that you're here and you love us. And God, use the people in this room to remind the people in this room of your goodness and your nearness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.